I want to build this community and empower you through what I've learned and inspire you, right? I My massive transformative purpose and what I think is so important for all of us to have is an MTP. My massive transformative purpose is to inspire and guide entrepreneurs to create a hopeful, compelling, and abundant future for humanity. And a massive transformative purpose is what you're telling the world. It's like, this is who I am. This is what I'm gonna do. This is the dent I'm gonna make in the universe. Hello, Nick. Welcome. Hey, Peter. Long Nick's time my no podcast see. producer. Yeah. Peter is, uh, hey, everybody, if you guys don't know, that's Peter Diavendos. Obviously kidding. Uh, but I hope everybody's doing well. I wanted to start this off by introducing myself. My name is Nick. It's lovely to meet you. Uh, yes, I'm Peter's podcast producer, but uh, around me and to my side and in front of me stands a team that worked incredibly hard to put together a show that felt like we could evangelize Peter's mission which is to uplift humanity through a podcast. And every single heart and soul on this call uh, helped us have that podcast ranked top 10 in the US in our first week. So my hat's off to you. Sincerely, thank you all. Uh, your support has meant the world to us and it's confirmed our efforts and it's just continued to help usher this mission forward and uh, put Peter in front of more people, which I think we need in a ever growing loud world. Uh, let me let me just take a second and and uh, also throw in my appreciation and thanks, everybody. Thank you for uh, helping me launch this podcast, and uh, it is extremely meaningful for me. I think we're living during the most extraordinary time ever, and my job is to counter all the dystopian negative news out there and help entrepreneurs see the potential they have to make the world a better place, to find problems and fix problems, which is why the world has the potential uh, it does. And um, this podcast, Moonshots and Mindsets, is all about helping people to inspire them to take their moonshots, to shape their mindsets. And I've said this before, let me just take a second to say it again. Your mindset is the most important thing you have. Uh, if you think the world is going to hell in a handbasket, then that's the way you're going to see things. If you see the world is filled with opportunities and the ability to solve problems and transform the planet, then that's what you're going to spend your time doing. Your mindset's more important than the technology you have, more important than the capital you have. It's what distinguishes the greatest leaders on the planet. So uh, with that, thank you and excited to have this conversation with you. Thanks, Peter. Uh, Peter, let's kick it off and let's just get warm here. Uh, I know you're in Santa Monica. Why don't you tell everybody how you're incredibly typical crazy day was oh, and, uh, no, how's that happening please uh enter your questions into the chat and we'll give nana some time to pick someone yeah uh, you know the one thing that we all have in common is uh 24 hours in a day uh you know uh, and 365 days in a year and uh that time is uh can get filled up very quickly and uh my biggest challenge is saying no so my days typically start uh way before 6 a.m and they go till 9 p.m and uh, uh, today was no exception. Let's uh, let's get going with the first question. All right, let's do it. Donna, uh, please feel free to find a question in the audience and pull them up. First up, we have Adrian Juarez. So Adrian, if you could please unmute yourself, that'd be great. Yes, hi. Hi, Peter. Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, so my question was, um, out of all the problems that you guys talk in your podcast, um, which one do you think is the most important one or urgent to solve? That means like the one that will have like the most impact on the most amount of people or maybe because it's the most neglected problem. Uh, Darren, first of all, thank you uh, for joining. Thank you for the question. And I, I think it is, it's really hard to, to, to point at any single problem. And I think everybody, everybody knows this. Uh, all of the problems are interrelated too. If you make, if you focus on education, for example, uplifting humanity, uh, making education available across the globe at the highest level possible, then you get a more educated, um, educated populace who's able to then turn around and solve problems where they live. Right. So all of these things are dominoes that tip each other. If you uh, if you focus on health and you make people healthier around the world, then the uh, their productivity increases, the amount of time that they've been spending not being able to be productive because they're not healthy, 
uh, uh, you know, gets reduced and therefore they're able to contribute more. If you give access to more energy to people around the world, then they're able to be more productive. So all of these things are interrelated and it's ultimately about how do you help people spend more time doing things that make the world a better place. Um, and, but you can attack it from many different, many different areas. I think the central point is, uh, is people's belief in themselves to solve problems. Uplifting that mindset element is very important and then empowering them uh, to, to do these things. You know, I've personally spent a lot of my time in the health space because I'm excited about it, of how do you add, you know, healthy decades to a person's life. I'm also very passionate about education and reinventing the education uh, space, but I don't I don't think you can point at one particular area. And um, at least I can't make that argument. People make an argument about uh, carbon and about you know the uh, environment. I completely get that. But you can attack that from, again, education, from energy, from health, from multiple different ways. So let me leave it at that, that it's a, it's a valid question I struggle with. Uh, my job is ultimately to help incentivize entrepreneurs, lots of entrepreneurs, to attack the grand challenge areas. And that's what we do through XPRIZE, that's what we do through this podcast, and, and hopefully uh, what everyone here is focusing, like, just take aim on one of those challenges and, uh, and attack it with all your heart and soul. Thank you, Adrian. This episode is brought to you by Levels. One of the most important things that I do to try and maintain my peak vitality and longevity is to monitor my blood glucose. More importantly, the foods that I eat and how they peak the glucose levels in my blood. Now, glucose is the fuel that powers your brain. It's really important. High, prolonged levels of glucose, what's called hyperglycemia, leads to everything from heart disease to Alzheimer's to sexual dysfunction to diabetes, and it's not good. The challenge is all of us are different. Uh, all of us respond to different foods in different ways. Like for me, if I eat bananas, it spikes my blood glucose. If I eat grapes, it doesn't. If I eat bread by itself, I get this prolonged spike in my blood glucose levels. But if I dip that bread in olive oil, it blunts it. And these are things that I've learned from wearing a continuous glucose monitor and using the Levels app. So Levels is a company that helps you in analyzing what's going on in your body. It's continuous monitoring 24 seven. I wear it all the time. It really helps me to stay on top of the food I eat, remain conscious of the food that I eat, and to understand which foods affect me based upon my physiology and my genetics. You know, on this podcast, I only recommend products and services that I use, that I use not only for myself, but my friends and my family, that I think are high quality and safe and really impact a person's life. So check it out, levels.link slash Peter. We'll give you two additional months of membership and it's something that I think everyone should be doing. Eventually this stuff is gonna be in your body, on your body, part of our future of medicine today. It's a product that I think uh, I'm going to be using for the years ahead and hope you'll consider as well. Awesome. Now we have Jeremy. Thanks very much, Peter. Um, so my question is probably a little bit more tool specific. I was playing with the GTP3 chatbot this morning and I asked it to generate a beat poem about carbon credits and it did it in about Amazing, a second. Amazing, isn't it? it? Like, I love it. it. Was, it blow away. <laughs> uh, it, was, it blew me away. I Like I thought, you don't get much more random than that. And, you going to um, read it to us? Uh, if you want me to, <laughs> the I'll first just couple go to lines. one of my colleagues. Yeah, by the way, I'll, I'll, I'll just read. It wrote yeah. it wrote two whole stanzas. I'll just okay. I don't know if you can see it. Yeah, there, I can't, it's but it's great. Go ahead. Yeah, it, it said carbon credits, a way to save the earth, a way to make a difference, a way to give birth to a new way of living, a way to be green, a way to make a change, a way to be seen. So that's the first stanza I from love it. GTP3 with the yeah. prompt. Uh, write a beat poem about carbon credits. Um, it was a bit of a, it was a bit of a um, homage to Tim Minchin, if any of you know my, well, a great comedian. But um, so it got me thinking about, um, you know, these tools. I mean, obviously Google, Microsoft, Apple, you know, are spending billions on training data sets and releasing these tools. But I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about how people who are starting or or trying to 
build exponential organizations and addressing some of the challenges you talked about. How do you see these kind of tools being deployed to augment our capabilities and, and how should we think about using them? Yeah. So uh, let me mention first that uh, Salim Ismail, uh, who is the creator of Exponential Organizations or Open EXO, he and I are writing uh, a book called, um, it's effectively the Exponential Organizations Playbook on how to create EXOs. And that will be coming right. out. I, I the, can't wait for it. By yeah. the way, I've been following you and Salim for a few years. And we're, it's just we're, amazing stuff. We're working on it. It's like final edits right now. Um, awesome. But so what, what you pull up, what you speak about is, is really important. It, it turns out, I think that every single profession, no matter what, how you think of yourself, if you're an artist, a writer, a physician, a lawyer, an architect, a designer, every profession is going to have an AI co-pilot. It's a phrase that Reid Hoffman, the founder of LinkedIn, I was having dinner with him a month ago, and he mentioned that. I, you know, I've talked about the idea that it's going to become malpractice to diagnose uh, as a physician without AI in the loop. But the idea of an AI co-pilot, someone or some a, a technology that is able to support you, right? So I just saw a you know, playing with GPT-3. And if, if folks have not been playing with OpenAI's GPT-3, you should. Uh, I saw a designer who said, I'm looking to create a fanciful living room design and so forth and described the intention, the emotion that they wanted. Can you describe what the design of the living room should be like? and give me three options and GPT-3 generated three options. And then the that particular designer put it into, I think it was stable diffusion and three photorealistic living room designs came up, right? So it's an incredibly creative tool in this case for an interior decorator, right? But it can be for a landscape uh, designer. It can be for a fashion designer. It can be for someone who's designing um, uh, you know, workout programs or dietetic programs, whatever the case might be. So I think all of us are going to have these AI co-pilots that are supporting you doing what you do uh, faster and better. I opened up by saying all of us have the same 365 days in the year, 24 hours in a day, and it's how you use your time uh, that distinguishes us. So it used to be, you know, 20 years ago, yeah, thereabouts, that if you needed to look up something for writing a book or a story, you'd go to the library and you'd take 15, 20 minutes to drive there, walk there, take the bus there. You'd hope they have the book. If they didn't have the book, you'd have to go find where the book was. Anyway, it would it would take hours out of your day to get a particular data point. Today, it takes you know milliseconds on Google. And so it's these are things, the, the phrase is called save time. And one of the things that these exponential technologies do is they create save time. So as a professional, uh, you will have your AI co-pilot provide you save time. So I have this patient with this set of blood level, blood test results and, and symptoms and so forth. Can you please create a differential diagnosis for me on what it may be? Um, that is save time so that you can actually deliver much better service in such little time. I think what we're going to start to see is around each profession, a set of AI tools, and it's still early. Um, I mean, OpenAI, uh, uh, DeepMind, uh, Stability.ai, uh, uh, Scale.ai, all of these are companies that are creating, creating tools. Um, anyway, Jeremy, that's the way I think about it, if that's useful. Yeah, that's awesome, Peter. Thank you. Uh, and yeah, it's the, very exciting. If I may, just very quickly, my son uh, is working for us doing a lot of writing and he's got Asperger's. So sometimes it's a little bit stilted and I've got him using Jarvis and Amazing. he's just blown away. He says it's it's improved his writing out of sight and, and he's able to output probably three times as much in the same amount of time. Um, and it's a lot more fun and he's producing great work. So that's that's just a really simple co-pilot example um, for somebody with a little bit of a learning difficulty and he's just loving it. Perfect. You know, the challenge I have is my 11-year-olds who are just doing, you know, homework now. 
It's like, what's homework going to be like when, you know, it's like, <laughs> yep, you have, you have to swear you're not going to use GPT-3. Yeah. Or, or GPT- uh, I'm sorry, Miss Jarvis ate my homework. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, a pleasure, Jarvis. Thanks, Peter. I'll let, I'll let you talk to others, but thanks so Thank much. You. That was that was fantastic. Appreciate my it. Pleasure. Dana, back to you. Thanks, Jeremy. Now we'll have Simone. Hi, everyone. Hi, Peter. I would have uh, a question about space because I am very interested uh, in space. Uh, Please. So the question is, uh, when do you think we will be able to travel in the solar system as simply as we do now with airplanes on Earth? Mm. And, so, uh, yes. Uh, and uh, how will be life for humans on other planets? Will we live on a uh, uh, basis uh, underground, uh, underground or uh, will there be uh, an atmosphere built uh, artificially? So, Simone, that's, a, is that's a fun question. Thank you for, for asking it. And, you know, I spent the first uh, 20, 30 years of my life passionate about space, right? Uh, Star Trek uh, captured my heart and my soul. I'm more of a Trekkie than I am a Star Wars person, just full disclosure here. Um, the, uh, you know, if you look at the early days of aviation, there was barnstorming came first. Um, And this was uh, just around uh, 1910 to 1925, 30. What happened was the people who had an airplane, these aeronauts, as they were called, would would fly over a little town. And and an airplane flying over town back then was really, uh, you know, an unusual sight. And the airplane would go land in a field and everyone from the town would go to the field to see this this airplane and this aeronaut. And the guy, or typically a guy, but could be gals as well, would sell for $5 for a day's wager to take you up in a barnstorming. And they would go up and fly around and come back down and land. And typically it was safe. That's the era we're in today. It's barnstorming. So when someone goes up on a Virgin Galactic flight or a Blue Origin flight or even a SpaceX flight to orbit, you're going up, you're paying a large amount of money, you're having this incredible experience, and then you land and back where you took off. And that's the era we're in. And then what occurred next was we went from barnstorming uh, to travel. Uh, first with airmail and then with point-to-point travel, right? Lindbergh in 1927 flies from New York to Paris and opens up the aviation industry. And uh, I think the idea of interplanetary travel, we need the vehicles. Um, There's no question that Starship is the first of those vehicles. Elon's got um, Starship under development today. And I think we'll see Starship uh, hopefully flying uh, in the next two, three months um, to orbit. And that vehicle- The big rocket. The big the rocket, big rocket. Yes. yes. I have uh, I have Starship uh, right back there in, in silver. I have, oh. I have Saturn V, uh, Falcon Heavy, and, and Starship uh, models behind me here. Um, anyway, the, the point is that vehicle is designed specifically uh, to be able to go- and land on the moon, and then be able to go and land on Mars. None of the vehicles we have built to date have been designed for that capability. And so it really takes someone with the incredible engineering intelligence and prowess that Elon has, and um, the wealth to be able to to pull that off. Now, as to where we're going to live on the moon, I think we're going to be living under the ground in what are called lava tubes, uh, there are these large, from the early formation of the moon, when it was molten to some degree, these large caves, if you would, that are sealed. Imagine being able to fill the lava tube with an atmosphere and you weigh one sixth of your weight, right? If you normally weigh 120 pounds, you weigh 20 pounds on the moon. And weighing that light with a pair of wings strapped to your arms, you can fly, which would be like, for me, that's what I'm looking forward to. On Mars, I I think on Mars, where you weigh one third of your weight, it'll be more difficult, but we'll have probably domed cities. And, you know, the science fiction has done an incredible job. It's the world changes very rapidly um, once we're also able to have AI and robotics in space where we can send 
humanoid robots uh, to the asteroids, to the Mars surface, to the moon, and have it prepare that situation for us. So when we land there, there's a habitat ready, the food is ready, the energy systems are ready uh, versus having to go and create it ourselves. Anyway, Simone, thank you so much for your question. Dad, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Simone. Up next, we have, um, my apologies if I'm butchering your name, but Bo, I think is your name. Yes, thank you. Peter, massive fan. Uh, I, I was recently introduced. Uh, I, I wish I was introduced to you earlier, but I'm just, I feel like I'm catching up uh, in the Welcome middle aboard, of Life Bo. Force. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm in the middle of reading Life Force right now, and I'm curious, it might be a bit of a spoiler, but I'm curious what uh, most excited you in 2020. And then a follow up question to that uh, What are you most eagerly anticipating about 2023? Wow. Um, so in, I, I, I wrote and published The Future is Faster Than You Think in 2020. Um, and then Life Force came out uh, at the beginning of this year. Uh, and I think it's, it's fascinating because every year I'm blown away by the incredible progress that we're making. You know, one of the things I do Bo, every year at my Abundance 360 Summit is I look back 100 years. And so in 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 2022, I look back to 1922. In 2020, I look back to 1920. And uh, and I look at, I ask the question, like, what's what were the breakthroughs back 100 years ago? And, and you should do this as an experiment for yourself. When you look back 100 years ago and you search far and wide for the breakthroughs, it's like, there weren't any. It was pretty slow, right? So I remember last year when I did that um, in in 1921, it was like Vegemite was invented. You know, it was like the uh, uh, water ski was like boards and and uh, and clotheslines was were invented. I mean, it was that kind of stuff. And you realize it's like the speed was so like molasses. And today it's incredibly fast. So, um, you know, for 2023, uh, I'm excited about a few different things. It really comes down to AI and biotech are the two areas that are moving so incredibly fast. We just heard today about an announcement coming out tomorrow around uh, fusion um, that uh, that we've finally been able to demonstrate sustained positive uh, uh, production of energy in a fusion reaction, which is a big deal. Right. If we look globally, uh, a country's GDP, a country's prosperity has been a function of its access to energy. And uh, we're going to, you know, fusion energy has always been 50 years away. Well, there are 37 privately funded fusion companies today and they're making breakthroughs. And tomorrow it's going to be a big, a big announcement. So I'm excited about that. So just what's going on in health in ed- reinventing education another so at a360 this year i've got some of the top ai experts coming to speak um and also sal khan coming to speak about education so it's about the convergence so super excited about where ai and education is going to go and where ai and health is going to go uh both of those fields are going to are going to transform ex- you know just shockingly fast and those are two giant industries that in my uh, estimation are ripe for disruption. So uh, tracking those and um, yeah, I mean, I, I'm excited about it all, frankly, but those are the, the areas in particular, Bo. Thank you. Now up next, we have Marianne, Peter. Hi, Peter. So thank you for being here. I'm a fan as well. I work okay. as a coach at the Flow Research Collective with Steven. Oh, fantastic. Steven Kotler is my co-author on my last uh, my first three books, Abundance Bold and, and Future is Faster. Yeah. I, I wanted to ask you about metaverse or virtual reality. Like, I would like to know your opinion on if this is for you, like, if it will be like a disruptive technology. And if yes, like why and which time frames do you believe it's going to be? And if not, like what could be blocking yeah. From that so, happening. Great, great question, Aaron. So let me tell you about how I think about the metaverse. What what do I think it is and why do I think it's going to be transformative? So when I look at these uh these areas, it's 
basically the convergence of multiple technologies coming in. So the headset technology, right? The VR technology, the AR technology, or they're sometimes called XR in combination is doing reasonably well. And I'm excited to see what Apple's headsets are going to be and what Meta's headsets are going to be like uh, in their next generation. So the headsets are getting better, uh, but there's a lot more to come. Uh, but once we have achieved sort of headsets that have uh, sufficiently high resolution and are comfortable um, and are able to actually uh, see your facial features and be able to represent how you look in the metaverse, that's the first part. The second part is going to be AI. So I was just with um, a guy named uh, Imad Mustak, uh, and we have recorded a podcast with Imad. Um, he's the CEO of Stability.ai. They generate, they have a, a product called Stable Diffusion that has been breaking the internet. It's it's like chat GPT. Um, Stable Diffusion uh, has been incredible. And what Stable Diffusion like Dali does is able to go from a, a written prompt describing something to a visual image, high resolution visual image, and they have gone, the first time they did it, it would take like 30 seconds to generate. Then they got it down to uh, real time to generate in, in a second. And now they've gotten it down to a 30th of a second. What does that mean? It means that products like Stable Diffusion will be able to generate live video. Uh, so imagine being able to be in a metaverse and have an AI creating that metaverse for you on the fly in photorealism. Um, and so I think we're going to move a lot of education there, a lot of interactive, like, you know, what we're doing right now is amazing two years ago. Now we've gotten used to it, all right? We've gotten used to this idea of free, live, you know, two di two dimensional conversations. Um what will occur next is we're going to be all together in a virtual room, sitting together, having conversations, walking around and seeing stuff. And then that will become uh, sort of the normal way. So I think about um, creating much more engaged uh, communities, much more engaged um, educational experience uh, and experiences in every part of our life. I think metaverse is going to, the other, the third part about metaverse besides the, the, headsets and AI um, is going to be uh, blockchain and cryptocurrencies and the ability to exchange value rapidly inside that. Um, and then being able to like, if you're in a metaverse and you see a can of Coca-Cola, that a digital can of Coke, being able to pick it up and then put it in your wallet. And when you're in the real world, you have a <clears throat> basically uh, uh, something that you can um, exchange for real Coca-Cola and you can move between the real world and the virtual world. And there's going to be this blurring of, of the, of the lines. So I think we're going to build new communities in the metaverse, um, new forms of government. I think that, uh, you will, you know, I'm, how do I describe myself? I'm <clears throat> live in Santa Monica. I'm a Californian. I'm a U.S. citizen. But I may in the future actually feel much more connected to being a citizen in a metaverse where um, I do my education, I actually earn my income, and there's a whole different set of governance rules. And I'm voting in that metaverse and I'm transacting in that metaverse. And, you know, my 11 year olds right now, they live in the Roblox uh, uh, metaverse. That's how they how they think about it. And the most valuable thing for them isn't dollars. It's Robux. It's the uh, cryptocurrency there. As soon as they get any money there, they translate it to Robux immediately. Uh, so it's it's coming fast. Um, yeah. Anyway, hope that helps, Marion. Pleasure. Thank you. Dana. Hello. Thank you. Now we'll have Maggie. Hi, Maggie. Hi, greetings from Greece, first of all. Hi. Καλησπέρα uh, σας. Καλησπέρα, καλησπέρα. Να είστε καλά. Είναι πολύ... I'm sorry about the Greek for a second. <laughs> αλλά είναι πολύ ωραίο ε, το ότι ένας άνθρωπος ε, που μιλάει τη γλώσσα μας 
Uh, and I'm going to take it in a second in, in English as well. I just paid my respects because, you know, it's all about origins. And uh, even though we do not speak about origins as much as we do, uh, it is very moving, especially for a small country as ours is to be seeing people like you being such an inspiration. So my question is um, pretty much um, very small, but also very big. Um, I want to know um, what you believe the greatest, like what your greatest fear for humanity is. Mm. Actually. Yeah. So that's a, a fascinating question, right? And, and it's a fair question to ask. Um, there are two different sides of the equation here. What do I think is the greatest uh, threat not being addressed is one side of the equation. I'll answer that because it's easier for me. And, and that is, you know, uh, I think the COVID-19 pandemic was, um, I don't want to call it a practice pandemic. My heart goes out to those who were, uh, who were injured by it. But I think there could be much worse pandemics. And hopefully we've learned some lessons and hopefully we've put some systems in place to be able to provide early warning and to be able to protect ourselves. I'm concerned about asteroid impacts. Uh, we are in a solar system filled with rocks that are flying around and every hundred years ago there's a major asteroid impact you know uh, luckily a lot of them have have been in um uh in the tundra of uh, actually the old soviet union which was a large amount of real estate or uh in the in the poles but uh a a rather small rock landing in the wrong place like over a metropolitan region can cause huge uh, uh, economic and life uh, damage. So I, the reason I'm concerned about it is it's an existential threat and it's got such a huge impact and we're not really doing sufficient work to be able to provide an early warning system. So I think about that. That's one of the, uh, you know, one of the existential threats that I'm concerned about. Uh, the other side is still is extremism uh, in, in the world. Um, and, you know, the question becomes, how do we prevent people from uh, from being in echo chambers and being in extremist situation and and being violent? Obviously, the technologies we're creating uh, are massively empowering to entrepreneurs, such as most of you here, to do make the world a better place, to uplift humanity. But uh, they can also be used for uh, for uh, negative. Uh, uh, purposes. And so um, helping <clears throat> helping people relate to each other is one of the most important uh, uh, objectives. You know, the analogy I use is each of us is not a single life form. Each of us is actually a collection of 30 or 40 trillion cells working together, right? Uh, that's what makes up your body. Every cell is alive. Every cell is an individual. <clears throat> and we work together as as um, you know, uh, as Maggie, as Peter, whoever it might be. And I don't take a, a knife and stab my arm uh, because it's me. Um, and so one of the questions is, how do we become more interdependent? How do we become more connected? How do I create a level of empathy with with you and everybody? And that level of connection leads us to a point where the better you do, the better it is for me right? That's the world I think we need to be heading towards. By the way, that's one of the places that the potential for uh, the ultimate level of brain-computer interface where I'm connected and you're connected and I understand your feelings and thoughts. And, you know, again, it's how do we uplift humanity all at once? So it's isolationism and, and, uh, and extremism that is sort of the, the challenge for me to, to think about. And part of that comes as well from the dystopian news media cycles where, you know, we're constantly bombarded by negative news and disinformation. Um, I'm not saying what, what the crisis news network, CNN, as I call it, or I don't have a good name for Fox. I'm not saying that what they're saying isn't true. What I'm saying is it's all negative all the time. And that's not a balanced view of what's going on in the world. There are so many amazing things going on that we just, they don't penetrate our psyche because we're bombarded by every murder, every crooked politician all the time. And that's shaping the way we think. 
right? Our brains are neural nets and we train neural nets by showing them example after example after example. And so if you're watching the negative dystopian news, you're training your brain towards fear and scarcity. And so I protect what I see, what I hear, what I read, who I hang out with very carefully um, because I want to train it in the, in the right, right way. Anyway, I hope that uh, that helps. Heidika? It did. I wanted to take it a little further to the mindset, honestly, and how we would be able to like seriously collectively, you know, see how a shift in mindset could be possible. But it was an exceptional answer on the existential and the other threats. So thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Maggie. Now we have Michelle. Hi, Peter. How are you? Hi, Michelle. <laughs> Thank you so much for hosting this. It's wonderful. Of course. So my question uh, for you comes from life force a little bit. Um, it says there that the, the length of medical knowledge now is about 73 days. So I want to ask you about your thoughts on the future of education. And it's kind of a threefold question. Future of education as it relates to decentralized education blockchain and the future of workforce, the kids that are coming out of college now, in terms of remote work. Uh, companies have the ability now to hire remote work so inexpensively. So how do you see the competition with the kids that are coming out of college in the US now without much experience with those kids abroad? Yeah, no, <clears throat> that's, a, that's a great question. So first of all, um, the the speed of change is accelerating is and and without question and the the question is what are we learning and i don't think schools are teaching kids um correctly anymore it mm -hmm. used to be that you would go and learn a skill or learn a body of knowledge that you would then deploy for the rest of your life Mm -hmm. And it used to be that life was actually relatively short. So 100 years ago, you would go to school till you were 20-ish, and you would take what you learned and used it for 20 years, and then you were dead at 40 or 50 years old. Now, um, we're in school, and we're living 100 years uh, on top of that. And uh, what you learned in school is basically vaporized in terms of uh, its utility. And so what we need to be looking at instead is teaching people how to learn um, and how to acquire new skills mm -hmm. and how to partner with technology. You know, it's, I say there's a tsunami of change coming and mm -hmm. your goal is to surf on top of the tsunami instead of being crushed by it. And mm -hmm. if you have a fixed mindset and you've learned what you learned and you're going to use it until you can't. That's just that's just wrong. So how do we teach our kids um, in you know how to learn on a continuous basis? And um, one of the things that you can either become an expert in the problem and then use new technologies as they become available to solve the problem, or you can become an expert in the technology, <clears throat> which once it's been uh, overcome by new technology is no longer valid. So I tell people, listen, find something you are massively passionate about, something you would die for and then live for it, right? How do you, and so one of the things I hope for my kids um, is number, there are three things. Number one, I want them to find their passion. What mm -hmm. are they obsessed about? Right now it's video games. Okay, got it. Great. They're going to live their world and the, their life in the metaverse. And so I can't deny them that, but what do you, what are you absolutely obsessed about? What what is your your purpose and passion in life? Can you can you find that mm -hmm. more than anything else? Because my passion and purpose for space drove me to learn everything I would learn over the next thirty years, way outside of school. I didn't I didn't use anything that I learned in school later on. I learned everything because of my passion and having to discover it along the way. The second thing I want them to learn is how to ask great questions. Mm -hmm. Um, I think one of the most, we're living into a world where you can know anything and, you know, chat GPT, Google, all of these things are going to make it more and more accessible. We're all going to have some version of Jarvis from Iron Man where you can ask a question and so forth. So if, in, if it's true that what's more important is the quality of the questions you ask, how do we cr create better question askers? Mm -hmm. Um 
And that's true for kids as well as for CEOs and entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. uh, and the third thing is grit, is not giving up. Yes. Um, and so for me, it has nothing to do with technology, but it's those those things that are going to allow you to surf on top of the tsunami of change instead of be crushed by it. And yeah, um, we're, you know, we're post COVID, we're doing two things. We're onshoring manufacturing. We're onshoring the supply chain because we want it accessible right there. We're going to use 3D printers and new technology and all of that. Amazing. And we're offshoring cognitive capacity, right? So I have members of my team that are uh, around the world and they're on Slack and on Zoom and on email and on Google Docs. And I don't know where they are anyway, anytime, and nor do I care if they are doing a great job. It's a complete six Ds, right? Digitized, dematerialized, demonetized, democratized uh, workforce. And it's the new world of work that people are going to be competing in, for sure. Anyway, I hope that helps. That's the way I think about it. Absolutely. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Awesome. Thanks, Michelle. Now we have Cece Wang. Yeah. Hello, Peter. And such a pleasure that I can ask you the question in person. I'm actually a huge fan. I have read your books and um, it, it definitely brought light into my life, looking at the positive impact that you know you. human and society have created in the past 100 years. I think where I'm curious is, when we're building exponential organization, looking at this uh, hockey stick growth curve, then we know exponential technology going to lead exponential change. Yes. And when I'm looking at organization in the same lens, and they don't necessarily configure and to unleash human potential to enable exponential growth. So currently, right, look at our society organization set up in this hierarchy is from a second industry revolution. Correct. It's still in this traditional model. So I think in my mind is uh, my mission statement is how can we build a conscious exponential organization? It, it, it go both ways. So one way is looking at facilitate exponential change through technology and otherwise facilitate a condition to unleash human potential. How would that merge together? What would be your advice in that? Yeah, listen, uh, today, you're right, uh, CC. today's organizations are not nimble. They are top-down structure and they don't um, enable sort of the speed and and there is a new kind of organization, right? And this is this idea of an exponential organization. And the the book that Salim and I are, are writing is all about about this. And in, an exponential organization is a much flatter organization. It's driven by a massive transformative purpose. That is the guiding principle and mindset uh, that everybody's aiming towards. It's a culture uh, that is data driven, not opinion driven. You know, it used to be that the expert, you know, was the you know, the the person whose opinion you listen to, and you know, I define an expert as someone who tells you exactly how can't something cannot be achieved, right? How it can't be done, and uh, we go away from expertise and we go to um, experimentation and data driven decision making. So I think um, the analogy I use is uh, the asteroid impact from 65 million years ago. So when the asteroid hit the earth back 65 million years ago, it changed the environment so dramatically, so rapidly that uh, organisms that could not rapidly adapt to the new environment uh, went extinct. And that was the slow and lumbering dinosaurs. But the furry mammals that were rapidly able to adapt uh, came out to dominate on the planet. And the asteroid in, hitting the planet today is this exponential change. It is AI. It is biotech. It is uh, all the exponentials, quantum computing, which we haven't talked about, which is coming, which is going to make AI look like it's standing still. Um, anyway, uh, so there's a lot of change coming. So it's how do you create agility? How do you create a, a nimbleness? Um, and uh, and a lot of the old style companies are not going to be able to uh, adapt and they will go away and there will be new business models, right? Very famously about three years ago uh, when Jeff Bezos was still CEO of Amazon at a shareholder meeting, 
he made a statement that said, I don't know that Amazon's going to exist in 30 years. I don't know if you remember that, but um, it was like, huh, good on him to say that. Uh, because the average life of large scale companies is is falling rapidly, and Amazon's one of the most innovative companies. And uh, even so, uh, there are going to be new strategies, new approaches that come along out of the blue that uh, reinvent whatever business Amazon's in. So, um, yeah, it it's I'm watching all the time to see. So we're going to see companies that are going to be built on top of AIs, right? Where, you know, every employee has got an AI uh, co-pilot of some type, where um, where AIs are driving a lot more than the humans are. I don't know, maybe. Um, I don't have an answer. You know, it's so funny because uh, when I was talking to uh, um, uh, Imad Mustak, the CEO of, uh, of Stability.ai, I, I said, how far out can you look? Meaning, how far out can you predict what's coming? Uh, because people ask me, I, you know, I go to Dubai to give a keynote and they say, Peter, can you talk about the world 50 years from now? My answer is no, I can't. I can barely talk about the world 10 years from now. 50 years is, is impossible. And so Imad said, you know, um, I can barely see two years from now. And I think that's what's interesting. We all have to be continuous learners, right? So in the chat, I saw someone saying, how, Peter, how can um, how can you mentor me and so forth? So that's what this podcast is about. It's about uh, mentorship. It's about uh, bringing the smartest people on the planet and talking about what are their moonshots and how do they see them coming? And then how, what are their mindsets? Right. And then, um, and then the other, you know, the books I've written, by the way, for, if you're an entrepreneur starting out, Bold is a really great how-to book for entrepreneurs. Um, the future is fast than you think is a, is a, is a great book that Steve and I wrote sort of looking at the next decade ahead. And then, you know, Abundance 360 is where I sort of mentor in, in group around 400, uh, entrepreneurs and CEOs. Anyway, uh, Sissy, uh, I don't think I gave you a straight answer. I want to walked around it, but I hope you'll, uh, hope you're okay with that. No, this is great. I, I thank you so much. I, I just wanted to acknowledge with your as inspiration and having me connect to my purpose is building conscious exponential organization that unleash human potential in the world of abundance that is love and peace and happiness. So I love um, that. I love can't it. wait to be part of the movement because that yes. gets me up every day getting lit up. So thank you yeah. so much. And, and thank you for saying that. That's exactly why, uh, you know, I, I'm, I and my team are doing what we do. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. A brief note from our sponsors. Let's talk about sleep. Sleep has become one of my number one longevity priorities in life. You know, getting eight deep, uninterrupted hours of sleep is one of the most important things you can do to increase your vitality and energy and increase the health span that you have here on earth. You know, when I was in medical school years ago, I used to pride myself on how little sleep I could get. You know, it used to be five, five and a half hours. Today, I pride myself on how much sleep I can get and I shoot for eight hours every single night. Now, usually I'm great at going to sleep. If I'm exhausted, you know, I've worked a hard day, I'm right out. But if I'm having difficulty, and it occurs, I'm having insomnia or my mind's overactive and I need help to get that eight hours, I turn to a supplement product by Life Force called Peak Rest. Now, Peak Rest has been formulated with an extraordinary scientific depth and background includes everything from long-lasting melatonin to magnesium to L-glycine to rosemary extract, just to name a few. This product is about creating a sense of rest and really giving you the depth and length of sleep that you need for recovery. It's a product I hope you'll try. It works for me and I'm sure it will work for you. If you're interested, go to mylifeforce.com backslash Peter uh, to get a discount from Life Force on this product but you'll also see a whole set of other longevity and vitality related supplements that I use. We'll talk about them some other time, but in terms of sleep, Peak Rest is my go-to supplement. Hope you'll enjoy it. Go to mylifeforce.com backslash Peter for your discount. All right, Peter, I'm going to take over. Why don't I bring one more person up to okay, stay? Let's do Apparently that. An awesome question according to Donna. 
Donna, I think it was Max. Yeah, Colin. Max. So I'm passionate about climate change. I'll have a master's in data science this coming May. Um, I wanted to get the bank for my buck. Should I work in EVs, carbon capture, fusion energy, development banks? What should I do? <laughs> uh, so Max, uh, it's whatever you're most passionate about. It's um, okay. There's no right answer. They're all going to be critically important. You're going to do your best work when you wake up obsessed by the field, right? Um, and they're all connected and they're all moving extraordinarily fast. You know, people say, what should I do? It's like, listen, um, go and do a dive into all of those. Who are your heroes in those fields? Who do you see yourself as? What is it that you want to do that wakes you up in the morning? Um, you can make a job out of anything, but there's only a few things that are going to light you up. And, you know, so you may or may not be successful. I may or may not be successful in what I'm doing, but if I'm doing what I love, then every day is an amazing journey. Every day is a learning opportunity. Even if you don't get to the end, um, you have, uh, you've, you've learned, you've shared, you've brightened up, you've contributed, and that's all we can ask. So anyway, Max, thank you. Peter, thanks for the extra five minutes. I appreciate it. You're welcome, my friend. Thanks, Max. Okay, Peter, I'm going to read a few from, from the type forum. Uh, one person asked, Satish Kumar Singh asked, which is the biggest change you foresee in how we, and they quoted, eat in the next three to five years? The, the biggest change I see how we eat is we're going to be measuring what's going on in our bodies a lot closer. And you'll have an AI co-pilot that is your food meister, if you would, saying, my recommend, you know, you set your goals. I want more energy. I want to lose weight. I want more muscle. I want whatever your goals are. And then based upon your objectives, maybe based upon your genetics, but definitely based upon your blood chemistry, uh, your AI is going to recommend what you eat. And so it's going to close the loop, right? Because right now it's open loop. You think you should roughly be doing more plant-based food or keto or whatever, but you don't actually know what's going on inside your blood chemistry. You don't actually know what's going to get you to your end goal. So it's closing the loop between sensors and AI that's going to change the way we eat. Cool. Next question. Uh, I love that, by the way. Always, uh, always a great use case for AI. What technologies, uh, I, I want to read the person's name out, Camilio Repetto asked, yes. uh, what technologies are directed towards eradicating clinical depression? Wow. Uh, so super important. Um, and the the challenge has been to date, it's only been pharma pharmaceuticals. Now, for the right situation and the right person, uh, antidepressants can work wonders. I had a friend of mine who was mildly depressed. I just was meeting with her recently, and she was on an antidepressant for three months, and uh, she said it was miraculous for her, and she wished she had known. She's off it now. Wished she had known, and she would have gotten it much sooner. Right? Uh, she was a cancer survivor, and so make amazing help for her. But what else is coming down the, down the pike? Uh, because we're always, everyone should be concerned about uh, over-medicating. Uh, there are strategies in the virtual world, um, being able to uh, be in VR therapy uh, and put yourself in different circumstances that visually and auditorily take you on a journey in a place that is happier, brighter, and can uh, uh, can help you. It's sort of like technologically augmented meditation. Um, the other thing that's coming down the pike that's a big deal is the whole world of brain computer interface. Our brain, you know, the two kilogram chunk of neurons, 100 billion neurons, 100 trillion synaptic connections, is a neurochemical soup. And, um, and depression to a large degree is due to an imbalance in that neurochemical soup. So the question is, if you have the right sensors and effectuators, electrodes in your brain, can you turn the dial? Can you turn the dial to be 5 or 10% happier uh, and do it in a way that is really rebalancing your neurochemistry as to what it should be? There are some people who have set points that are naturally optimistic, uh, naturally sort of uh, brighter, and those that are unfortunately, naturally more depressed? And can we use uh, BCI to 
to transform that, not in an addictive fashion, but in a rebalancing fashion. So for me, those are the two areas. Uh, you know, I'll mention that we're also going to have a brand new generation of meds coming that are going to come from AI discovery and quantum compute, quantum chemistry um, that might be made specifically for you, but that's a little bit further out. Fantastic answer. And this next one, it's a, I'm going to put a spin on it so everybody can walk away with uh, some 2023 value here. Um, what is on your mind and what are your goals going into 2023? How do you set goals? How do you think about the new year, et cetera? Uh, my goals for 2023, um, it's really to build this community. Um, I want to build this community and empower you through what I've learned and inspire you, right? I My massive transformative purpose and what I think is so important for all of us to have is an MTP. My massive transformative purpose is to inspire and guide entrepreneurs to create a hopeful, compelling, and abundant future for humanity. So how do I inspire you? How do I guide you? Uh, and, and the inspiration and the guidance is through the things that we're doing here. And ultimately, it's giving you uh, the, the tools, right? Um, so uh, there's a question that just popped up. Uh, who should we have as a podcast guest? Uh, please, uh, I look forward to people's input uh, on that. My other goals for 2023 are uh, around uh, uh, launching a X prize around extending the healthy lifespan of humans. I'm super passionate about that. It's uh, it's doing more to support entrepreneurs at scale. Uh, and, you know, I think we're living in a day and an age where we can dream bigger than ever before. And I hope that all of you do. I hope that you up your game, uh, that you focus on the world's biggest challenges because they deserve your attention. Uh, And you deserve to be making a dent in the universe. Nick uh, and Dana, thank you. Thank you, everybody who joined in. Grateful. And thank you for helping us take this podcast uh, to one of the top 10. And tell your friends and uh, see you guys all soon. Everyone, this is Peter again. Before you take off, I want to take a moment to just invite you to subscribe to my weekly tech blog. Today, over 200,000 people receive this email twice per week. In the tech blog, I share with you my insights on converging exponential technologies, what's going on in AI, how longevity is transforming, adding decades to our life. In the tech blog, I often look at the 20 meta trends that are going to transform the decade ahead and share the conversations I've had with incredible tech thought leaders on how they're transforming industries. If that sounds cool to you and you want to try it, join me. Go to diamandis.com backslash blog, enter your email, and let's start this weekly conversation. Let me share with you the incredible progress we're seeing in the world of technology and the positive impact it's having on our lives. Again, that's diamandis.com backslash blog. Looking forward to sharing my insights and incredible breakthroughs I'm seeing with you every single week. 